thank you everyone for joining. Today, we will be covering a step-by-step -step guide testing for Zephyr valve. So we're very excited to share this information with you. Should be very um, educational and helpful along your Zephyr valve journey. First thing we wanna share with you, a few housekeeping items. We want you to be able to submit your questions into the Q&A box. So if you scroll down and you see, you know, a bar that has a little chat bubble, that is where you can submit questions as well as the Q&A, which has two double bubbles. And that is what we will use when we are um, doing our Q&A live at the end. So please be sure to submit those during the presentation. We also will be sending you a follow-up email with helpful information of, uh, after the webinar. So we hope that that will also guide you along the way. This is part of a webinar series. So we have four total, and we also have these on our website. So you can view um, the other ones um, recording wise, so you can watch them on demand, but you also can register for our next upcoming webinar um, that tells you more about what to expect before, during, and after the procedure, which is coming up um, in September. So we hope you can join that. So without further ado, we'll pass it over to Nancy Collar, who is our speaker today with a breadth of knowledge that we are so excited for her to share. Nancy, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm excited to share um, a little bit with you guys about how the Zephyr valve procedure can help you breathe easier. So I'm, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. I'm a respiratory therapist. I've been doing this for about 37 years. I love what I do. Um, I currently am the lung navigator for our interventional pulmonary team here at Inova Fairfax Hospital in Falls Church, Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC. Um, we are excited to be treating, we've just treated our 100th, um, I say unique patient. It's a patient, patients that have come for the first time. We have patients that come to us from all over the country as well as the world. We have somebody coming to us soon from South Africa. So, um, Love, love what I do, love to help people breathe easier. Um, certainly, um, I'll go over how you can find a center close to you as during my presentation, but anyway, welcome. All right, so here's a, a quick um, agenda of what we're going to go over today, the different tests, basically, that um, you will be asked to go through if you um, desire to be worked up to see if you would be a candidate for this procedure. So the first thing I want to focus on is um, when you're diagnosed with emphysema, and I'll keep in mind, emphysema falls under the umbrella of COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. A lot of pulmonologists and a lot of people in the, the medical field interchange emphysema and COPD. So try not to get caught up if your doctor uses emphysema or COPD, we, we usually mean the same thing when we talk about that. We rarely will say COPD when we're talking to an asthma patient or a patient with chronic bronchitis, we'll rarely say, use the term COPD. So first of all, when you're diagnosed with emphysema, one of the first things that your doctor is going to do is prescribe medications to help you breathe easier. You guys all are probably already on some of those medications. Um, you'll need to continue to follow up with your doctor about um, fine tuning those medications. The next thing that all patients that are diagnosed with emphysema should be directed to do is attend a pulmonary rehabilitation program. That's vital to your better breathing. It helps you understand not only how to exercise to help strengthen those muscles that are helping you breathe, but it also gives you education about your disease, about how to do activities of daily living while, you know, breathless. Um, those kind of things. We have an amazing virtual program that our program here at Inova has, has been using. It's uh, available nationally as well as throughout the world, as long as you have an internet connection. So um, there are options for you if you happen to live in an area where um, pulmonary rehab, some, some of them are still shut down from COVID. Some of them um, just never came back up. So if you um, need that resource, and your pulmonologist isn't aware of it, you certainly are welcome to reach out to me. So the next thing that we're really excited has that has come into fruition in the past, um, I guess, 2018, is our minimally invasive Zephyr endobronchial valve procedure. And that's, we call that bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. So that's a really big fancy medical term for lung valves is what I usually say. Um, other options after that are 
lung volume reduction surgery, which obviously that's a surgery, you're being cut open, the lobes, the two upper lobes of your lung are being removed. So it's a permanent thing, um, carries with it a lot of healing afterwards, um, and then lung transplantation. So some of our patients that we do valves on can also, can, they can go on to these other two procedures. So they don't, the valves do not preclude you from these if that should become something that you needed to do down the road. So we have a lot of patients that um, got valves and now have gone on for lung transplantation. So, all right, next slide. So we have some criteria that we look at to determine if, if you're gonna be a good candidate. And what we mean by that is, will you get benefit? It's not really about, oh, you don't meet all the, the you, we can't check all the boxes. It's really, if we do this procedure, will you feel like you can breathe easier? That's really what we're looking for. So the first thing we wanna know, obviously, is we need to, we do this for patients that have a confirmed diagnosis of severe COPD or emphysema. Um, that's based upon your pulmonary function test that you do at your pulmonologist office. Um, most of you have to stop to catch your breath often, even when taking your medication as directed. So you still can't complete, you know, a, a paragraph, for instance, or two or three sentences without having to stop and, you know, get catch your breath. Um, and then on your pulmonary function test, we want to see one of the values. It's called FEV1. We want that to be equal to or less than um, 50%. And that's the amount of air that you can blow out in that first second of your breath. So your doctor, your pulmonologist probably has been telling you about percentages and numbers. And that usually is what we call the FEV1 FVC. So it's a different um, part of the test that your pulmonologist normally tracks and normally re, you know, re, reveals or con conveys to you. That's how they determine the severity is based upon that separate number. So that's just a little bit about that. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna go over the pulmonary function test. And again, I would encourage you to go to the mylungsmylife.com website, look at their resource page, go to their videos, and all of these tests are, are explained in a really nice video there. These are some of the slides um, from the video as well that just explains really nicely all of these tests. So the first test, pulmonary function test. So hopefully this looks a little bit familiar to you. If it doesn't, um, then this is a test that is required to determine if you've been a candidate. Um, I just call it the body box test. It has a really fancy term called body plethysmography. You don't need to remember that. It's just you do need to get into this clear box. And yes, the door does need to be shut. And that's because we need to measure all the air in your lungs. And this is really the only way to do it accurately in a patient like yourself who has emphysema, who has by definition, a lot of trapped air. Um, so you get into this body box, the respiratory therapist instructs you on different breathing techniques, which I will be honest with you are not easy especially for you guys with emphysema. So we understand this is a very, very difficult test, but it also is very important. If there was another way for us to measure this, we would. So basically you're gonna be instructed to do some different um, types of blowing, um, panting, um, and then we're gonna measure, we're gonna take um, three different measurements from this test to look and see if you would be a good candidate. Um, but again, the most important part of this particular test with the body box is that amount of air that's left in the lung after you've blown out everything you feel like you can blow out. You're like, my lungs are empty. They really aren't. And yours with emphysema really have a lot more air than um, even normal lungs. All right, next step, next slide. The next thing that we're going to have you do is a CAT scan. It's a CT of your chest. Um, you guys probably mostly have CAT scans for lung cancer screening, I would assume. Um, if you don't, you probably want to check with your pulmonologist because you probably qualify for lung cancer screening CAT scans, which should be done yearly. This CAT scan is going to be more of a high resolution CAT scan, a really specific CAT scan that we want to um, look at really thin slices. And so when I say that, that's kind of the equivalent of if you were gonna take a picture with an old Polaroid camera versus one of, let's say an iPhone 13, or even better, a, a professional camera, like a Canon or something. The, the quality, the pixels are much um, higher. You know, they're, they're more pixels, which makes the picture 
brighter and crisper. That's kind of a good analogy of this type of CAT scan that we need. We need a lot of images, really good, high quality photos of your lung, because we're going to then upload that to um, a pulmonics um, software called Stratix that's going to give us some really fine details about what percent of your lung tissue is destroyed with emphysema. So I call that an emphysema score. Um, it's going to give it to us by lobe. So this picture on the bottom right is a little hard to see, but you can kind of tell that there's five lobes in your lung, three on the right, two on your left. Um, and it's gonna give us those destruction scores by lobe. So that's really important. Um, and that's how your doctor is then gonna decide what lobe is the target to place these valves into. Um, it also tells us the, the, um, the walls or the fissures between each of those lobes, it, those need to be complete. And as you do your um, testing, your coordinator will explain more about why that's important. So um, that's why this CAT scan is really important. Okay, next thing that um, honestly is not a mandatory test, it is optional, is an arterial blood gas or an ABG we call it. Um, it is a blood test that we draw, we draw that from your artery. Usually it's the artery in your wrist. And the reason that that's important, the reason that's not just a regular blood draw, like you probably had done a lot, you know, for regular um, blood work, this is a special test because the arteries carry the oxygen in your body and also the carbon dioxide. So we breathe in oxygen, we blow out carbon dioxide. One of the problems with emphysema is your body's ability to get rid of carbon dioxide as well as your body's ability to use or uptake oxygen. So it's really important for us to look and see it, are those values within a certain range. Um, as a rule, your values are gonna be, your oxygen level is gonna be lower than normal and your carbon dioxide is gonna be higher than normal. That's, that's where you guys live. Um, that's just a standard that we all expect. Um, so talk to your doctor about whether this test is, is absolutely required. And if it is, then um, the respiratory therapist drawing the blood, um, I'm sure will do an excellent job and make it as pain, pain, um, you know, not pain free, but as, as painless as possible. So it is a quick test. We get the results very quickly. And then they would follow up with you about those. Next test is a six minute walk. So the number one question that I always get from my patients is, I can't breathe. How do you think I'm going to walk for six minutes? And so what I want to tell you is it doesn't, we're not asking you to run a marathon. We're not asking you to even walk the entire six minutes without resting. All we're asking you to do is participate in the test for six minutes, which means don't quit. Once you start walking, keep walking. If you need to stop to take a little break, stop and then continue. Okay, you are allowed to be on whatever oxygen is required, whatever oxygen your body requires during this test. This test is not to determine the amount of oxygen you need. That's a separate test that sometimes is also called a six minute walk test, but that's more for oxygen qualification. In this six minute walk test, we're simply looking at distance. How far can you walk in six minutes? And we're going to compare that. That's used. Um, in a lot of different programs to see how patients like yourself with emphysema have improved after pulmonary rehab, for instance, or after lung transplantation, or after this Zephyr valve procedure. We want to see that number go up after we do the procedure, which indicates that you have improved. Next test is an echocardiogram. I like to just call this an ultrasound of your heart. That's most people have had an ultrasound of some kind. Um, so this test takes about 45 minutes. The reason that we're looking at the heart, as most of you probably know, our heart and our lungs are connected. They work together. Um, and so sometimes patients can have issues with their heart that are actually contributing to shortness of breath. Um, and so if we're going to do the valve procedure on you, we want to make sure that we've either optimized or eliminated any other reasons for your shortness of breath besides the emphysema. Because when we follow up with you after the procedure, we want to, we want your shortness of breath to be able to be monitored, um, or you to assign a score to it. That's 
um, indicative of just your lung disease and not other factors that might be causing shortness of breath. So I'll give you another example, belly fat. You know, one of the things that I don't think we're going to go over necessarily, but we do have a, a BMI um, cutoff for this procedure. And some people might say, why? And that's because belly fat actually also contributes to shortness of breath. So we want you to reduce that belly fat so that your lungs actually have more room to breathe and can do their, their job. So the same with the heart, the heart, um, the left ventricle or the left bottom part is our pumping chamber. That's what actually makes our blood pressure. Um, that has got to be pumping effectively for you to not get short of breath. Otherwise, blood backs up into the lungs and you get short of breath. So we want to look at that number. The other number we're going to look at is your pulmonary artery. So it's the vest, the big vessel coming from the right side of your heart into the lungs. If that number is high, then that's going to cause shortness of breath. And that number can be high for some different reasons that we'll evaluate. Um, so that's why we do the echocardiogram. If the numbers are outside of the acceptable range, then your team will send you to a special um, cardiologist. Our team has a team of um, cardiologists that we deal with that understand the valve procedure and that then can do further testing to help us determine if this patient can be optimized or if this patient just is not a candidate for the valves. All right, next test. So this is what we call a perfusion scan or a blood flow scan. So after we've done the CAT scan of your chest, which is looking at the airflow and looking for things like nodules and other things like that, we also wanna look at the blood supply because let's say that your doctor has determined that your right upper lobe, for instance, is the target lobe that he wants to place these valves in. That means that that lobe is now gonna be deflated with the valves. We want to ensure that the blood supply to that lobe is also low. We don't want to deflate a lobe of your lung that has the most amount of blood supply going to it. So that's why this, um, we call it a spec CT. That's why this is so important is to make sure that we know what the blood flow in each of the lobes of your lung is compared to the destruction in each of the lobes of your lungs. And then we look to see what the best target. So this is really helping us fine tune that best um, targeted lobe for you. This is another radiology exam. It does um, require some dye to be injected. So that's done through a little IV that's placed in a vein. Um, it's about a 45 minute test. So a little longer than just a quick CAT scan, which is literally about five minutes, um, but it is really, really helpful um, to, to have this done. All right, so some common testing questions that we get. We're gonna go ahead and address those now because that might be the majority of your questions is, can your current doctor do any of these tests? Yes, your current pulmonologist should be able to do all of these tests or order all of these tests. They, most of our pulmonologists can do pulmonary function tests. Most of them can do the body plethysmography. All of them can do a six minute walk test. All of them can order an echo, a CT, and a spec CT. So there's really nothing that they can't go ahead and do. Um, your center that's close to you, your coordinator will let you know um, what that looks like. I know for, I'll just say for instance, our center, because we're part of the national registry, um, we do all of our testing at our hospital, unless you come to us with all of your test results. That's the only way that we take tests from outside. Um, it just, it's too much piecemealing together. So if your doctor, outside doctor wants to order all of these, certainly let them know, here's, here's everything I need. And then you can call the coordinator once you have all your results. Um, can the test be done in one day? Absolutely. Because we have patients coming from a distance, I always schedule patients the test in one day, but I have to be honest. And I tell all of my patients this, it's a long day for you. It's morning to night. It's five tests, plus usually an office visit with the doctor. Um, the pulmonary function test alone takes about an hour and a half. The six minute walk, you might say, oh, what's well, six minutes, right? Well, maybe, but maybe you need to rest before you do it. You definitely will want to rest after. So that's about 30 minutes. The, the echocardiogram is about 45 minutes. The spec CT, the perfusion scan is about 45 minutes and the CAT scan is only about 15 minutes. Um, so it is an all day procedure, but it definitely, I mean, all day testing, but definitely can be done all in one day. It just takes some coordination with all the timing of things. 
Um, there's no such thing as failing the six minute walk. I get that all the time. Well, what if I failed it? Well, I don't understand what that means <laughs> because we're, we're just looking for how far can you walk prior to your procedure versus, af versus you know, after we do the procedure. So I will give you an example. If you can't walk at least a hundred meters, we're gonna require that you go to pulmonary rehab and get to at least where you can do hundred meters in six minutes. That's very doable. It's not, I've never had a patient that um, originally couldn't do hundred meters that after two weeks of pulmonary rehab could now do hundred meters. I hope that makes sense the way I worded it. So increasing your, your six minute walk distance is pretty easy with some pulmonary rehabilitation. And that's really muscle strengthening, focusing on your chest, core, and shoulder muscles. Those are the muscles that help you breathe. So um, yes, you, there's really no such thing as failing. You do your best, participate in the test, keep walking. You'll be able to do at least hundred meters. And then how long before you get the results of the test? So most of the tests, we have the results within just an hour or two. The CAT scan though, like I said, we upload that to a secondary software that um, Pulmonics has. And that usually takes about five to seven days for us to get those results. So your coordinator probably will not call you for about a week after the test, just because they wanna have all of the information. We, at our center, we do not um, disqualify a patient just based upon one test value. We look at the whole picture. Will the patient, benefit? Will the patient feel less short of breath after this procedure? And we really um, have found that that CAT scan, that Stratix analysis is really critical in our ability to answer that question um, as with as much of an educated guess as possible. So, all right. So how do you find a doctor? It's actually go to the um, mylungsmylife.com website there's a link at the top that says find a Zephyr treating physician and you simply plug in your city and it will tell you, it'll show you a map as you can see here on the right. It will give you the um, doctors, the, the facility name, the address, the doctor's name, and then their coordinator's name and contact information. Um, so that way you can contact them. And let's say that we have a lot of patients whose um, kids live in one area and they live in another and they want to come stay with their kids and have this procedure done. <clears throat> That's a possibility for you as well. So if you live someplace different than your children um, or your support system, I should say, um, there's, you don't have to go in the area exactly where you live, but this is how you can find a place, um, really any center throughout the country, um, this website. So get familiar, please, with this website. It's amazing has a lot of great resources and I think will answer a lot of your questions. All right, thank you so much, Nancy. You covered so much, appreciate that. And right now, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna answer some of your questions. So I think um, you may have had some trouble adding things into the chat earlier, so you should be able to do that now, as well as into the Q&A box. So let me go ahead and one moment. Let's see here, what do we have? First question we have here, Nancy, is I've had all these tests done a few times. My oxygen level is at 17%. Would I qualify? I would need to know what you mean by 17% because that, does, that number doesn't make sense to me. Um, so yeah, because okay. the amount of oxygen in the air that we breathe is 21% and when we, quote, um, like saturation levels, for instance, 17% wouldn't be compatible with life. So I don't think that that's what you're talking about. I'm trying to think of a pulmonary function test. Maybe, maybe you're talking about a pulmonary function test. Maybe one of those values is 17%. Um, in that case, um, you would qualify. You would be on the, the lower end um, of that. So yeah, that would really require discussing that with the coordinator so that we understand what number exact value you're talking about. Great. Thank you. Um, we have someone here asking about, um, can you post a link to a virtual pulmonary rehab? And I believe Nancy, do, do you guys have one? Yes. Let me see if I can find the, you don't have, um, we can actually find it and share it okay. in our chat. Yeah, but it's, it's called home rehabilitation network. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. 
And can you talk a little bit about the how important uh, pulmonary rehab is? Yeah, so pulmonary rehab, I was talking earlier um, and you know, you've heard, uh, most people have heard of cardiac rehab because heart disease is very prevalent in our society. Um, and obviously cardiac rehab is really important to all of those patients. Pulmonary rehab has a different focus. You know, cardiac rehab, your focus is gonna be aerobic activity and eating less fat. Um, pulmonary rehab is really more about um, strengthening the muscles that help you breathe. So I mentioned this briefly earlier. So they're called your accessory muscles of breathing. They're your chest, core, and um, shoulder muscles. So think an easy exercise you can do at home that doesn't require any equipment are wall push-ups. Stand about a foot back from the wall, put your arms up on the wall, and then do a push-up. If that's really easy, put your, push your feet back a little bit. Do another wall push-up. Do three sets of those, three sets of 10 a day. That by itself, you're strengthening your chest, shoulder, and core muscles with that one exercise. Um, so it's those type of exercises that are valuable to strengthen those muscles. So when you think about the diaphragm, the diaphragm is the big muscle of breathing underneath your ribs. And if you'll watch some of the videos on the, the My Lungs, My Life website, you'll see what I'm talking about. That diaphragm is designed to help us breathe. And it should do this. It should come up like a nice upside down U when you breathe out. And then it should drop down as you breathe in and your lungs ex you know, expand. With emphysema, instead of it coming up and down like this, it goes like this. So I was giving the example earlier of take a deep breath. And if you have emphysema, don't do this. But for patients who don't have emphysema, this is how I um, give them example of how you, you feel with emphysema and how you breathe. And then breathe at that level. You can do that for a little bit. And then after a while, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't get any more air in. <laughs> I got to get my air out. That's how you feel all the time, but you can't just get the air out because the elasticity in your lungs doesn't allow that tissue to, to cinch back in like it should. So they stay hyperinflated or with too much air. And so your diaphragm, because it can't do the work that it was designed to do because of what I just explained, your body is now using those accessory muscles of breathing to help you breathe 24 seven, 365. People with normal lungs only use those accessory muscles of breathing when we exercise, when we get really stressed, um, you know, you have a, a stressful situation and you start hyperventilating, you're using those accessory muscles of breathing to help you breathe. So that's not, they're not meant to do that 24, 365. Okay, so that's the importance of pulmonary rehab is not only to learn specific exercises to help strengthen your lung muscles, but also to give you education about how to take the medications. Do you use a, a holding chamber with your meter dose inhaler? Do you take a deep breath and hold it or do you suck in really fast? Like how do you, how do you take these different inhalers? There's different techniques based upon the inhaler. Um, how much oxygen are you on? Is there a less, uh, uh, a device that weighs less that you might qualify for. Maybe you qualify for what we call nocturnal ventilation or nighttime support that allows your muscles, your respiratory muscles to rest at night so that during the day you have more energy to breathe. Um, those are all things that a pulmonary rehab program will address with you. Um, so pulmonary rehab is just, is, is critical and is different. Um, the, the, another thing I was mentioning earlier is the foods that you eat. Um, patients with emphysema, like I said earlier, as a rule, have a higher baseline carbon dioxide level than normal lungs. Um, carbohydrates that we eat produce carbon dioxide. So patients with emphysema really should be on a low carbohydrate diet, not necessarily for weight loss, but for CO2 production. You don't need more carbon dioxide in your body that your body is not able to effectively get rid of because of your disease, so. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question. Uh, you may not be able to answer this, but um, I've had a transplant, um, would I still qualify? That's a good question. I can honestly say I haven't had that question before because by definition, you no longer have emphysema. Okay. So I would think no, but that would be something that I think the team would have to kind of put their heads together and say, here's an out of the box, you know, patient. 
Shreed, would you have any answer that? I can jump in really quickly. Um, so if this is a bilateral transplant, I'd probably the answer is, is no. But I'm assuming if it's a single lung transplant, we've had several cases in Europe where the native lung, meaning the non-transplanted side, ends up hyperinflating and pushing down on the transplanted lung. So yes, there is history in us having treated the non-treated or non-transplanted native lung. Uh, if it's a bilateral, I just saw that, yeah, I don't know if you have any history treating someone who's had bilateral, but uh, depends upon how far long ago it was and what's happened to the disease in the lung now, so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, I know you answered these a little bit, Nancy, earlier, but I just want to reiterate it for him. So can you talk a little bit about, one, failing the walk test and also if they can use oxygen? Absolutely, you can use oxygen. This is not an oxygen challenge type test. We're not trying to see how much oxygen you require at home. That's a different type of test that can also be called a six minute walk test. So I understand that's confusing. Um, our goal for this particular test is distance alone. So we want you to walk. I mean, if you can't walk at all, I mean, we have had a couple of patients who physically they have issues with, with walking and they can't, that's a different story. If you're able to walk at all and, and your shortness of breath is truly what's limiting you, then just participate in the test, walk, stop, you know, take three steps, stop and take a breath, take three steps, stop and take a breath, just participate in the test for six minutes. Um, and then again, make sure that you're in pulmonary rehab. And I guarantee that as long as you physically can walk, um, that number is gonna go up. Great. And then this is a question, um, not particularly about um, the test specifically, but can valves be put in more than one lobe? They can. So as a rule, if um, I don't know if we can pull up the picture of the lungs. I like this, just a Stratix picture, but um, like I said, there are three lobes of your lungs, three lobes in the right side of your lung. And it's pretty common for us to do the right upper and middle lobe together. So technically those are two lobes. The middle lobe is pretty small, but technically it's two lobes. Um, so that, that's done pretty routinely. Now, if you, want low, if you want valves on both sides, so that would be two separate lobes, but on two different sides, um, some centers are doing that. Um, that would be a center by center and a physician um, you know, determination. Um, at our center, we do, but we do them separately. They're separated by at least a year. So we'll do the valves in one lobe, track the patient, make sure that they're improving, and then um, assess them a second time if they want to do um, valves in the opposite lobe, or the we call it the contralateral, the, the other side. So it, it's possible. All right, great, thank you. And then can you talk a little bit about the recovery time post-procedure? Mm -hmm. So the procedure is um, a quick, you know, maybe an hour long procedure, depending on your physician. You are put under anesthesia, so um, you are put to sleep. Um, a long camera is thread down through your lungs. And again, take the time to go to the mylungsmylife.com website, look at the resources and look at the videos. And there's a nice video that shows you about this. Um, the valves are then placed, you're woken up, you're admitted to usually a general floor and you need to stay right now. Um, Medicare requires a minimum of three night stay. Um, so that's what most facilities are continuing to abide by is that three night minimum stay. So I say three sleeps, don't get caught up in the days, day one, day two, go by nights. How many sleeps do you have? Um, and um, the first day normally, you are on complete bed rest. And I tell my patients, we're trying to baby your lungs because if I've deflated one of the lobes of your lung, then the opposite, the other lobe in that lung is now have, having to take over that work. So sometimes that lobe is now like having a party in there, woohoo, I can stretch in all these different ways because I have more room and think the elasticity in that lung tissue is already destroyed. So now if it stretches a little bit too much, then it pops a hole. So picture that balloon that you blow up that one extra time and it pops. That sometimes is what happens to that lobe on the, on the same side as where we place the valves and you get a hole in that lung. It's a microscopic tear. It's called a pneumothorax. That's the medical term. We just say hole in the lung. It happens about 25 to 30% of the time. So it is something that everyone on your team is watching for. There are signs and symptoms that are very clear to 
to see and they're on top of it. They have, they'll have all the equipment at the bedside that they need to do to treat that. Um, and your doctor will get that treated just as quickly as possible um, with a tube that then allows the air to come out of your chest so that that hole can heal. How long that hole takes to heal is, is patient dependent, um, but it, it will heal on its own, so. Great, thank you so much for answering all these questions, Nancy, really appreciate it. I can't emphasize enough, go to mylungsmylife.com, um, click on resources, go down to the videos, watch the videos, just soak in as much of the information on this website as you can, because it really is incredibly helpful. It's incredibly, it's worded the way that you will be able to understand it. And um, yeah, reach out. All right, thank you so much. All right, so like Nancy said, please visit our website. There's a tons of resources for you to watch um, videos. There's other webinars you can uh, look at. And then also there's articles that you can read about too to continue understanding your disease. Um, you can also call our Zephyr Care team by calling 833-654-COPD. So speak to someone live. We also have chat on our website. So you can also chat with someone if that's more comfortable for you. So we are definitely here for you. And we hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining uh, this webinar today. Thank you.